Hello there. Good afternoon to um, everybody that's joined us today. Welcome to the first ever BPCA webinar. Um, part of what we want to cover today is that we hope to better give you some short um, but straight to the point refreshment on knowledge and also to give you that confidence with some of these um, uh, tricky decisions we have to make out in the field. Uh, for those that you don't know, my name is Natalie Bungay. I'm one of the technical officers for the BPCA. Um, and today we'll be covering direct bait application into burrows, which I'll get started with in a moment, just once I've gone through a, a few bits and a few rules for today. Um, as this is our first webinar, I do have my beautiful assistant, Scott, at the back there, who uh, no one can see, but if anything does go wrong technically, Scott will certainly try and help out with that. So do bear with us. If I do unmute you, we're just trying to sort something out, but we'll see how we go with that. Um, I'd just like to actually thank as well, this presentation was actually developed by Crew, and they've been kind enough to allow us to use the presentation and hopefully um, give us an opportunity as BPCA to um, connect with our, our members and anybody else that's joined us and talk about um, you know, a bit more detail with it. It's a very brief presentation and I don't think there'd be anything in there that's going to be a real shock or a surprise to you. However, I think it's really good for refreshing and renewing that confidence in burrow baiting because we all know that um you know with uh, you know label restrictions and the um, crew stewardship we're always not too certain about what we can do so we can cover that and also hopefully we get some questions going um so yes just a, a little bit of uh, the ground rules so you will see that you have um, a question feature on the page there so if you do have a question please type it in there. I will see the questions pop up to the screen to my left. So I might be looking around a bit like this. Um, and if I can answer those questions as we're going through, I would like to do that just to give a bit of depth to um, the question that you have in relation to what we're talking about. Uh, we uh, have 102 attendees at the moment. So um, that number may build. Um, if I find I get quite a few questions during a particular element of the presentation, then, you know, we may wait till the end, but we'll just see how it goes. And I promise I'll try and get to them. If uh, we do struggle and we get to, you know, past about an hour is, is, is the maximum we want to do here. Um, I've been assured that we'll, we'll, we'll give you an email afterwards. We'll take your questions. We have them saved. We have your email and um, yeah, we will get back to you on email, the questions if we don't manage to answer them here. So um, you are all muted to me. I can't see any of you either. So if anybody's shouting out any questions, I certainly won't be able to hear you. Um, also with the questions, if you just ask the question once, as I said, it does pop up to the, the side of me and I will try to address it. But if I don't, don't start repeating the question. Um, I've been told that um, if you spam the field, you might get banned. Um, that's a, a decision to be made. But yes, please just put the question once. That'd be great. Um, and also after the presentation, there will be, uh, you can download the video. So it's going to be recorded. So if you need to use it at any other point, um, feel free. Um, yeah, I think that's um, about it. So I think I'll get started with the presentation. I will share my screen with you now. Okay. So yes, um, direct bait application then into burrows, justification and mitigation measures. The, the most important thing, as we know, with anything we do in pest control, justification is key. And then also mitigating any circumstances where problems may arise. And of course, when we're using rodenticide, very, very important. Um, so let me get started with this. Click on here. So yeah, first off, with anything, as I said, there's going to be no massive surprises in this presentation. We'll, we'll cover a bit of the basics about, you know, why we do burrow baiting, because that's going to be uh, an important element when it comes to you assessing. So rodent infestations should be removed as quickly and effectively as possible due to public health risks. Um, I mean, just thinking about the word public health, um, you know, we always associate that when we're talking to customers and we talk to them about, um, you know, their particular problem. But public health, it, the purpose of it is actually for the benefit of the whole society. So it's not just, you know, that individual customer that you've got, but also for the, the wider community. You know, we don't want these pests. And in this situation, you know, brown rats, because, you know, it's a public health problem to the, the wider society. Um, and also uncontrolled rat populations, um, they cause damage and contamination and spread 
rodent borne diseases such as um, leptospirosis, um, salmonella, these are all other pathogens as well that we don't want um, to be um, causing issues with our customers, absolutely massively important. Um, so burrow baiting, it aims to reduce and eliminate the neophobic reaction. Um, you know, we know neophobic reaction, uh, something scared of any new things that appear in the environment. I mean, I'm certainly scared of new things sometimes when they appear, but you know, certainly we know that with brown rats. If we introduce something new, i.e. a new food, they will have a slight um, reaction to it, but also put that in a bait station. There's also a, an extra neophobic potential response there. So that can cause issues. Um, so, burrow baiting technique. So, as I mentioned there, to reduce and eliminate the neophobia um, to bait containers. Um, it is, neophobia is one of the biggest challenges we have for Norway rats, that behavioural trait. So, um, important that we address that. Um, neophobia, as we, you know, is um, the exceptional wariness of that unfamiliar food, so, or unfamiliar places. So, again, like I mentioned before, if we can present that new food source into an environment that is closer to where they live with less disruption so no bait box it's going to be more preferable to them and it's actually supported by a DEFRA funded research um, have a little a, a read through through that but they found that yeah tamper resistant containers although they could work and as long as they're checked infrequently um, it's going to suggest that little rodent control can be achieved by using those. So yes, the um, advantages. So area of use. Now um, we know all the changes that have gone on with the uh, rodenticide labels recently. The words, you know, um, open area and in and around buildings and outside and inside. So um, you know the, the labels on these products now, you know, they have a, a term on there, open areas and in and around buildings, which are generally where rat burrows are found. So certainly burrow baiting, in terms of label use, it is. Um, uh, authorised on there. However, it's really important to remember, and I was actually reading a bit about this the day on one of the rodent um, rodenticide labels. Uh, it's actually a first generation anticoagulant and, and it states on there you shouldn't use it in burrows. So there are some products that are not suitable for burrow baiting. So please always make sure you, you read the label on that one. Um, you can probably get some CPD points for it as well. Um, so we, yeah, we know um, that the rodent is also in that area when we are using any pesticide you know if it, under cosh but also the label we need to know that the animal we're targeting is present so what is better than having their harborage and actually um seeing that they're living there for all the the different signs that we're aware of um and also it's more likely to be encountered and consumed for for reasons such as you know the animal is in close proximity so if they find a food source that's close to where they live we all enjoy that um if we can uh, also, it's a, a reduced impact on non-target species. Um, the accessibility to non-targets, such as you know, be field mice or field voles, they're not going to be entering. Oops, sorry, I just come for screen there. They're not going to be entering burrows um, where you know their predators are. You know, brown rats can predate on them, so they're not going to be present there. So it's a lot. It definitely reduces the impacts on those non-target species. So some some really great great reasons there checking the question, I haven't got any yet, so hope that means I'm covering it all. Okay, so um, burrow baiting, why? Uh, yeah, the technique of burrow baiting is backed by many organisations, you know, ourselves, um, CEIH, is actually a really good document that CEIH has in their, their resources. Um, it's mentioned here in one of the statements, as you can see, but um, if you go into their resources and under uh, pest control, you can actually look for the document called CIH uh, rodent procedures. So that's a really good document to have a look at, as well as the all of the crew resources and some of the bits that we have as well. It's really important you drag your knowledge and your um, uh, um, documents from from different angles so you can get different perspectives on things and then make your decision because this is all about it's about you making your decision on on how is best to do it as long as it's safe and we'll come on to that in a moment hopefully i'm talking and everybody can hear me okay so um i'm being told that i am being, I can hear me okay great 
Right, okay, so yeah, the, but however, you know, there still is a risk. We talk about rodent furrow baiting um, and how great it can be, but there is still a risk and we need to mitigate this risk. So careful environmental risk assessing is essential. Um, with bait, bait ejection, um, you know, bait becomes available to non-target species um, as, as rats will kick it out. So this needs to be one of our predominant considerations when burrow baiting. Uh, in, in one study, bait was ejected from 56 out of 106 treated burrows um and you know it, it's something you certainly need to be aware of and consider within your environmental assessments but you know how, how do we prevent bait ejection so we can cover the bait as per the standard procedure um you know cover the entrances of baited burrows to reduce the risk of bait being ejected and spilled out um so these are all the things we do we need to record that information as well uh so regular reassessments. If we're if we're, if we're doing a, an environmental assessment, a risk assessment, or any assessment, we need to reassess them. Doing them once and then leaving it to the side and not worrying about it too much is 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 not good practice. You need to make sure if you're making the effort to do an environmental assessment on the use of rodenticide is that you reassess that. Um, which templates you use is completely up to you. You can your crew have templates. Um, other, you, know, you may have created templates yourself as long as the essential information is there in terms of, you know, do you really need to use this rodenticide? Do you need to use it in this area? Is there anything else you can do? And if not, then great, you record that information and reassess it. Just, it's, if you're doing the work psychologically anyway and you're thinking about all these things, write it down. That's what the, the best um, advice I can give you really. Um, so yes, regular reassessment. Um, carefully consider the greatest risk, like I've mentioned with the bait ejection. I, I tend to cover things before they come up. I'm quite efficient at that, as you maybe some of you will notice. Um, but yes, yeah, so prevent this ejection. I can't, can't get that across enough. That is the main concern. Um, sorry, I need to go back on there. It came up. So very, yeah, so um, burrow baiting should not normally be used when safer methods of application and practical equally effective so again going back to the assessments like I mentioned before when you're doing an assessment do you need to do this so as much as we said borough baiting is great you need to make sure you've got justification that you need to do it is there any other proofing that you can do um, clearing of the food and water sources all the things that we always think about you, you still need to think about doing those non-toxic things those environmental controls very very important um, and then if and when we do need to do it we can um, go on. So I've just got a couple of questions I'm just going to cover at the moment. Um, so we've got one, is the kind of baiting still part of the 35 day, if, is this kind of baiting still part of the 35 day rule? So um, thank you, uh, Dennis Anderson, that was from. Um, yeah. So the 35 day rule is not so much rule, it's guidance on the label. And basically on the label, the statement goes, and don't quote me, um, but it says the guidance, if you have still got activity after 35 days, then you need to reassess what you're doing to see whether you're missing something. So it's guidance. It's not a you've got bait down for 35 days and that's it. If you haven't got rid of your rat problem, you need to take it away and put your head in your hands and cry for the day. You, you don't need to do that. You just need to make sure that what you're doing really is the right thing. And if it's not, you can get support, you know, whether it's from us or um, anybody else that uh, could come along to a site and help you with that. But there may be an underlying issue that's not being addressed. So, yeah, the 35 day rule, of course, it applies to any use of rodenticide, but it's a guidance. It's a you really should get control. If you haven't, there might be a resistant problem if they're eating rodenticide, but they're not actually succumbing to it and you're not finding dead rodents or, you know, you're not getting that activity reduction. And there may be a resistance issue, which, you know, you can get your tail testing. I think when the University of Reading didn't do that. Um, details to follow later on. Um, so, yes, I've got a, an anonymous question. Would you recommend to put wheat based bait into a burrow loose or in a plastic bag? I will be covering that in a, in a bit. Um, so I will leave that one until later. If you don't mind, anonymous attendee, I will cover that momentarily. Um, and a question from Elizabeth. So do you have the assessment forms? Are they available online? Um, I do actually. So crew on their website under 
the downloads and resources you can it's they've actually got guidance on completing environmental risk assessment also so have a have a good read of their guidance and then they've got a form i've actually got one here i think i was going to try upload it but it looks a bit like this i don't know if anybody can see that but that's the crew one that you can download from their website um, as long as the information that's on there um, you have within your own document that you might want to create that's fine as i said before as long as you've got that important information on your own documents it, it's all good but yes there is one from the crew website um, so i think i've yeah we've got that one good okay so yes hopefully that helped a few of the other other listeners and, and answer some of your questions you might might have had uh, with regards to that quite efficient on that wasn't i was quite quite pleased with myself Okay, so the crude um, code of best practice, that was the one, as I said, uh, Elizabeth, that's the document there, you can see it's the same as the one you've got on your, your the presentation there. Um, you've got to follow the risk hierarchy um, mentioned earlier about addressing proofing, but you've still got to do all these things, you know, you treat burrow baiting the same as you would treat any baiting, any use of rodenticide, it's absolutely no different the purpose of today is really to say that and then also say so if we do do it what's the safest way because we do feel that that type of baiting is um trickier in terms of mitigating that risk so but yeah you've got to follow the same hierarchy you would with any other procedure so proofing environmental controls um uh, trapping you know topics about glue boards and uh using gas in burrows that's kind of another subject for another day but that isn't mentioned in the crew code of best practice if again after this you download it and have a look you will see you know all the all the all the different things that you can do before you start using rodenticide all the same considerations um as i mentioned they, they do talk about first generation anticoagulants before second generation also but I don't think there's any of the first generation that actually allow for burrow baiting. I could be wrong. Again, read your label. Um, always recommend that. Um, so yes, the areas of use, you've got to make sure, again, that you can use it in burrows and also that it's for outside use, of course. Um, site survey, all, the, all these templates here, site survey, risk assessment, cost assessment. If we don't have these documents, crew will have them on their website. They're so readily available there. Um, if, if you don't already have them yourself, if you haven't got those templates, we can help with them. But yeah, site surveys, risk assessments, all need to be done alongside with the environmental risk assessment as well. Um, and record your findings. Like I said before, it's we spend so much of our time doing these assessments and putting effort into learning how to do them and doing them legally and competence. But if you don't write them down, you're kind of wasting that time in a way. You know, if something did go wrong, how are you going to prove that you've done everything you could to prevent that thing from going wrong? Um, you know, that that's a real key to it. So if you're making that effort, make sure you, um, you know, record it down. It's um, a good thing to do. So and obviously, after you've done all these things, searching for rodent bodies, the same, the same things you do for you know, when you're using bait boxes or any other type of baiting, you search for those rodent bodies if there's a potential for them to be outside any, in any way to obviously reduce that carrying feeding um, activity for secondary poisoning. And follow-up. So we'll talk a bit about follow-ups in the moment, um, um, how regularly it should be. There's never a, a specific number associated with it, um, but, but we will go into that. And also, I promise, uh, Anonymous, we will talk about... Um, you know what types of baits we, we can use within burrows. I just had another question actually just before I go off the page. Um, so is 100 grams still recommended for burrow baiting as I think I saw in the crew booklet that you should increase bait used if you find you are getting a take? What size do you increase the bait applied to then? Well, I mean that's a nice long question. So um, on the label, I've got a label here. So the label is actually a legal requirement, but it gives you a lot of um, information and guidance on exactly how to use the product. So, for example, it talks about it covers Rattus norvegicus um, up to 200 grams every 10 meters, up to 200 grams every five meters. It doesn't mention specifically how much to put into burrows because it does say on this label you can use it in burrows. So I would say you carry on with the same you know, 200 grams 
per road and by road, depending on um, how far they are spread away. So there probably isn't one answer to that. If you've got three or four burrows in a small area, then maybe you would just bait, say, two of them with uh, the equivalent of 200 grams, depending on that area coverage. So uh, a very tricky question to answer in a generic sense. Um, but I would say read the label, see what they say their dosage is. And in terms of metre squareage and see how many runs you've got and um, go with that. Otherwise, um, send us some photographs, pop it on an email to me and we'll have a look and we'll, have, we'll make a decision on that. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's answered that one. Anonymous, you can tell me if I haven't in a moment. Um, so, yes, retrieval of bait as well. The retrieval of bait um, in burrows, see if we're using bait boxes, it's a lot easier to do that because, you know, you open your box. Rats are gone, take the bait out, we're done. Whereas with burrows, it's subterranean, so it's going to usually be within soil. And as you'll see, the recommendations that will come along in a moment is that, you know, it's as deep down as possible. So that retrieval is usually pretty hard. Um, but as long as you try everything reasonably practical to remove that bait. Um, but again, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. OK, so, um, yeah, so consider. So most rat burrows are found outdoors, as we know, where the condition of the um, substrate permits rats to you know, excavate the soil. As I said, there's subterranean and they'll get down there and other material. Um, therefore, you know, it's likely that non-target animals will be present at many sites where they burrow. So the environment that they're in, the, um, you know, the next where nature wants to be, these birds and like, foxes and domestic cats, you know, they roam. This is where they, where they will be a lot of the time. So we need to consider that area of treatment and say, right, what risks are here? Considering if you're in centre of London or the centre of Bristol or the centre of Edinburgh, it's going to be a different environment to if you're on a farm within rural um, East Anglia or Kent. You know, it's, it's going to be slightly different. So, of course, we need to consider that area of treatment. Um, also, sorry, I just skipped onto that. Um, in any given situation to proceed with with burrow baiting, again, as I've mentioned before, it must outweigh the risks with regard to um, human and animal health. If you, which normally it does, if you've got brown rats that are present on any site that someone has noticed them, it's normally because they're causing a problem. They're either entering a grain store or they're damaging stock or they're getting into a domestic property and um, uh, causing, you know, potential for for diseases and pathogens so you know normally when they're noticed they are causing a risk to human and animal health so um you know as long as we've considered all of the non-toxic bits before again you know um ensuring that that burrow baiting is necessary is also important um you know care should also be taken to identify rabbit burrows um versus rat burrows as well i mean it might seem strange but sometimes i uh, have seen that confused before, uh, especially in rural areas. But those, these are the sorts of things that we need to make sure we're considering and protecting yourself as this presentation states, it's, you know, mitigating these uh, these risks and making sure that what you're doing is legal. Because it's, it's absolutely legal to bait burrows, of course it is, as long as you're following the label and you're being safe and you're not causing any potential harm to any other non-target animals or people. Quite straightforward really, isn't it? Um, and how you go about that is is a process. So, um, yeah, and the, the environmental risk assessment will identify um, the risk to these non-target animals. As I said, that form I showed you, um, there's two pages on this particular one. I um, don't know if you may have some another template. It might be a bit longer or a bit shorter, but the important things is that, you know, you identify what the problem is, what you've tried to do with it that's non-toxic, why you're using non-toxic, etc. And then also um, what problems you, you see are, are there, whether there's any uh, birds of prey um, or carrion feeders and what you're going to do to uh, mitigate the risks of anything um, coming to harm them. Okay, one more questions? No. Okay, so yes, reduction, uh, risk mitigation then. So um, go into a little bit more detail that might answer again this um, loose baits, plastic bags, things like that, a uh, question that we had earlier on. Um, so reduction of risk, uh, you know, is required when rodenticide is used, therefore burrow baiting will not be used as a routine practice. I mean, any 
use of rodenticide will not be used as a routine practice. Whether you're burrow baiting, putting it in a box, hanging it on a string in a sewer, it will not be a routine practice. That's label conditions, quite straightforward. Um, also, it uh, consider use where bait application in tamper resistant or covered bait stations have been unsuccessful. So, you know, as much as we, you know, the, the rodents being attracted or rodents eating the rodenticide more readily because there's less neophobic uh, concerns there, you know, the bait's not within a box. So we may think, oh yeah, we'll do that first because that's going to have more effect. The crew, the crew guidance is that you must consider using tamper resistant or covered bait stations first. Um, before we consider burrow baiting. You might do both, but again, it's why environmental assessments, things like if you make a decision that, you know, this is a really bad problem. We, we spoke earlier about, um, you know, weighing up, you know, the, the risk to human health and the need to use rodenticide or the things you're doing. Sometimes you might say, well, I'm, I am using um, these covered bait stations. There's a bit of feeding in there, but it's taken a long time to get control of them because they're neophobia. You then maybe have this great reason to say, you know, in your environmental assessment that I also need to do this burrow baiting to complement this integrated approach to complement my um, treatment. And I, you know, certainly, you know, BBCA, that is something that um, we would support. As long as you write it down, you make sure you're safe and you do all the checks and assessments that you need to do. Um, so reasons why the methods are impractical should be documented um, as well such as um you know bystanders should be informed um it's i'm surprised i haven't really got any questions on this at the moment but it, you know when you're you treating burrows a lot of the time you know they're not always going to be near to buildings um i know that when the when denticide labels initially changed it was changed to in and around buildings and um, whereas actually there's a new phrase on there just saying um outside i'll have a look on there put the notes on there um so we can actually use these products now where the problem or the rat infestation is actually not associated with a specific building for example gamekeepers and such things um so we can use it in open areas and if we're doing that you know how you know do we still need to label it do we need to put signs up that we do cover that in a moment but in short yes um you do need to inform any potential bystanders um the fact that you've got rodenticide there uh, i've got another question from another anonymous why would bait boxes that any non-targets can enter be preferred to targeted baiting of rat burrows as i said um so there is sometimes i uh, this is why i like to have conversations um with people because there can be some confusion between this you know it, um it may seem better for non-targets to burrow bait however the guidance that crew gives as you can see here is that you use tamper resistant first bpca's view as i said also in uh, alongside that was that you know doing both would maybe be a good integrated approach or if you can justify that okay i could use bait stations but it's going to take a lot longer the, that means the rodenticide is going to be in those bait stations a lot longer so it's going to be present in the environment for a lot longer and that's bad for rodents um so therefore i'm going to borrow bait because i'm going to come every other day or every day, depending on what you assess it as necessary, um, going to pick up the rodents and it'll be done within a week or two weeks, whatever it is you assess. So as long as you write it down, that's what you're doing, that is your justification, then I say, uh, I agree, you know, rat burrows is certainly a way forward for, for burrow baiting, but you need to justify it. Um, another question from Martin, how close to water courses can I burrow bait? So I do cover this in a minute. There's no, there's no meterage. There's nothing, you know, you'll notice on labels we'll refer to it. So I have got one here, actually. Let me just read the statement um, on here. So let me just find it. Um, remove food. So uh, apart from this, do not clean up the infestation. Sorry, I'm just going to find this is very important. 
wherever baiting close to water causes or uh, uh, water reserves, you must ensure that your rodenticide basically does not come into contact or contaminate that water. So um, just don't contaminate it. If you're confident that what you're doing is not going to contaminate the water, then um, in your burrows don't enter that water. I would say 10 metres, burrows that are less than 10 metres from a uh, water course, don't burrow bait. That would be my assessment, um, just in case those burrows do happen to move out into the stream of water and also you need to consider water vole things like that it gets into a different realm of discussion there but um that would be my guy i'll be straightforward 10 meters from uh, a water course i i wouldn't burrow bait um, but again if you assess it and you're confident it's not going to be a problem then write that down if that's what you've assessed and you're confident and great and uh, and off you go with it um I've got one more question, then I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, so when several rat burrows are identified, is it worth covering with soil first before baiting in to the burrows to see which ones are actually active? Good question. Um, I would say from experience and what others have told me, normally you can tell whether a burrow's active or not without doing that. You know, if rodents are going in and out, it's going to be smooth on the outside. You might have hairs there. You might, you know, if you stand there for half an hour later on in the day, you might see them running around or, you know, all these signs. You, pro you, could, you can probably assess quite confidently that, yeah, these are active burrows. If you're not sure, then yes, absolutely. If you think, well, there's one there that looks a bit smooth down, there's possibly some grass or weeds growing from it or, you know, you're just not sure, then yes, absolutely. Um, Glenn, heal it in, um, come back couple of days later and then yes if they've reappeared i know we do that with moles don't we but yeah you can do that with rats but i think a lot of a lot of the time you'll be able to tell whether they're they're active or not um hope that answers your question uh so have i done that bit yeah i don't want to go on to the next slide without covering it here we go okay so risk mitigation so as with uh other external use for size environmental risk assessment i'm going to say that word quite a lot through this presentation environmental risk assessment and read the label um is something i always say it's just one of the most important things for you to remember um so Deep baiting should be carried out uh, with a long handled spoon. I've got a nice photograph there of a, a long handled spoon. We've all got them in our, um, our tools or other suitable equipment. Many other available. Um, and note that baiting bus buckets also should be labelled with a copy of the Redenticide product label. Again, I was reading uh, a label earlier. Sad existence I have, but I was. Um, and, and it says actually on there, that you're not to decant that product. I think it was a 20 kilo uh, bucket that had two 10 kilo bags in it. And you're allowed to take one of the bags out and put it into another bucket, but you can actually tip it up and decant it. It's a weird thing, but that's the term of decanting. Um, but if you were to do that, as this, um, the, as this slide shows with that bucket there with no label on, that would be against label conditions. You need to make sure you print off a new label and relabel this bucket. Um, I think your suppliers will normally have copies of them or the manufacturer will have copies of them uh, readily available. You need to make sure that um, you do that. Um, so yeah, as I've mentioned before, burrow baiting will be kept to a minimum. Um, introduce bait into the burrow as deeply as possible. Just a bit of guidance here. Um, I mentioned before, obviously there's subterranean and th these deep vertical burrows are preferable. Um, as, as we were talking before, one of the biggest risks to this is the bait ejection. So if you've got a burrow that's quite quite close, to, you know, kind of goes down a bit, but it's quite close to the surface. If you're burrow baiting there, there's more chance they're going to kick that 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 grain or whatever it is that you use. Again, none of us are going to be uh, approaching that question in a moment. Um, they're going to be able to kick it out easier, aren't they? Whereas if you've got a burrow that kind of goes straight down and you're burrowing and it's falling to the bottom here, yeah they're going to struggle to kick any of that loose grain out really really going to struggle so um, again consideration of when you find burrows assess okay where are they going how are they entering into the soil um, one of the most important things and quite a, you know maybe we don't do it as much as um, as we should and hopefully some of you think yeah you know that's a that's a good idea um, so yes so deep vertical burrows the, the shallow ones not as good just going to ask another get another question here um, 
when several rap bros are identified, is it worth covering? Oh, sorry, we've done that one before. Um, Simon, sorry, Simon, I, I skipped um, past yours. So in the study carried out, was there a pattern in what redenticide was rejected? Um, if you visit the DEFRA website, I'm sure you can download a, a copy of that report. I did actually go to have a look at it the other day for myself, but uh, I didn't find it. But uh, they, I'm certain that that would have been covered. It was a very in-depth report um, that was done. And Simon, if you give us a call um, in the office or give me an email, um, natalie at bbca.org.uk and just ask me that question, I'll try and find you the, the link for it. No problem at all. Um, so I've uh, got another one more down here. Oh, sorry, I've just gone past there. So we've got Andrew Purcell has asked a question. So deep vertical burrows are often associated with drain defects. Of, so yes, another element to considering your environment. If you've got lots of burrows and you think, oh, there's a, a drain cover over there or a, a sewer, yes, these are the sorts of considerations. You may think, well, there might be a drain defect. And then, I mean, to be honest, any drain that I see near any, um, or sewer, should I say, are technical terms for them, but a sewer or drain, I'll be opening that before I do anything anyway, because it's something I like to do. If you see a bit of soil within that drain as well, it's an indication that, yeah, those burrows are possibly associated with it because of that digging has fallen into that um, ruptured pipe um, and then caused that soil to come through to the sewer. So absolutely, Andrew, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, they can be associated with drain defects. Uh, so, and it's, you know, we can use a lot of these, these baits in sewers, um, but again, on the label, um, you have to secure them and make sure as far as reasonably practicable that they don't get washed away or they don't contaminate the sewer. So we do still, even though sewers are not the most um, uh, loveliest of places, we do still need to make sure we're not contaminating it with our, our identicide. Um, okay, so treat only active burrows, of course. We talked about a question earlier with regards to, you know, how do we know they're active, but your experience um, should tell you that. And if you're not sure, we can heal them in and come back another day. Uh, so yes, to the uh, formulation, the block bait use. So labels again, I have looked at a two or three labels of block redenticides and most of them say that they're fine to use in burrows. Um, so as long as they are, um, just fasten them on a robust, you know, robust wire secured in, um, some sort of anchor, something that you are happy is safe. That's all. There's nothing that's patterned for this or developed specifically to be particularly fancy at securing it, just secure it. And if you're happy, it's secure and safe. That's what is necessary. Um, so again, we're talking about identifying those burrows uh, this is very slow. So yeah, treated burrows will be clearly marked or recorded. In terms, just to go back to that, sorry, I'm, with the block baits, um, just in case it doesn't pop up in this presentation, I think it does with regards to which is best, but I'll, I'll address it now. So whether you use block or, and with the grain bait, whether it's bagged or not bagged, again, it really is a judgment call. There was a period of time when Everybody was saying, yes, absolutely, got to be in a bag. Um, and then a period of time when, no, it shouldn't be in a bag because they could they could just get hold of the edge of that bag and drag it out. Um, I'm with the, or the BBC are with the opinion that uh, loose grain bait um, is best for, to prevent that dragging out. But then if it was in a bag, it's easier to uh, retrieve afterwards. So again, it really comes down to your own assessment of it. And if, for example, if you use uh, a bagged grain um, and you're not really sure how these rodents act or what's going to happen afterwards, it's your first visit, make sure you do a visit within the next day, maybe just to see what behaviour. And if they've pulled that bag out and it's sat on the surface, these things can happen. You go, right, that's not the way forward. So you take it away, you open the bag and you put it in loose. And it works vice versa as well. If you put the uh, grain in loose and something happens and they kick it out and you come back your next visit and think, OK, yeah, that's not good. They're, they're acting in a way that's kicking that grain out and I'm not happy. I would rather it in a bag, put it in a bag and put it down. You know, there's, inter there's this, the crew code of best practice goes through it a little bit again. I recommend you download that and, and read through it for some detailed advice. But that 
you know just to cover it very uh, basically that would be our advice is that um you know anything you do do just come back very soon afterwards and assess what you've done and say yep i'm happy that's certainly safe um and and if it's not you know you change it things can happen um so yes treated burrows will be clearly marked or recorded now on this on the labels i'm not showing you the label i've got because obviously it's a particular product and you know we don't want to promote any particular products but they all say pretty much the same things um but the statements along the lines of you need to clearly mark your area of treatment and record it so again you take it on on your own account of, of what that means when you're burrow baiting whether it's signs or whether it's if it's all enclosed and it's secure for any other access and it's only your customers that's there you make them aware on your written reports um you know msds sheets things like that but as long as it's clearly marked and recorded or recorded is the one they say but as long as you're happy the information's there and there's no risk of anyone coming into contact with that redenticide and who wouldn't know what that is um so that's advice again a discussion point to have if needed in the future uh lightly block beta burrows so once we've treated them um you know there is the um uh we always sometimes want to you know, get a big rock and really stick it in there and heal it in and you know you almost have to get a crowbar to get it out again but the guidance is is that you lightly block those burrows um possibly you know if they're if they're blocked and uh, too heavily it may encourage different behaviors that would then disturb your treatment. Um, whereas if you lightly block them, it encourages that um, feeding behavior to go on within, um, within those burrows. So that's a particular recommendation. Just checking my questions. Oh, we've got a couple here. So uh, yeah, pasta, grain or blocks. Read the label, whatever, you know, whichever, uh, you know, has been over wraps their, their natural food is um whole grains you know but some rats will actually maybe prefer pasta or maybe prefer blocks um again pasta baits i don't know which ones are authorized for the use in burrow baiting um but if there are any uh, again read a label um you know if you think you know your rapid population is particularly um keen on pasta then you know use whichever is going to be the most effective in the shortest period of time that's what we want to do um so another question from martin so all burrows should be closed after baiting to reduce bait spillage question mark yeah as i just sort of covered there um they should be they should be closed afterwards but the guidance here is is that you lightly block those you don't um uh sort of get a big rock and you know smash it in there um okay so regular inspection like we've said before regular inspection of these treated burrows is essential now um in terms of regularity um i mean again the guidance here is that check preferably in the early morning for ejector so not not so much intervals but if you when you do go back check early morning because any ejection or any issue will be caught early before maybe those um scavenging um animals that we don't want to poison uh will be about so you get nocturnal feeders of course but it, the guidance is that preferably check early morning for any ejected baits um you know until you get used to the behavior of the rats if they are going to eject the baits in some circumstances it won't happen <clears throat> so um yeah inspection frequency um should be determined by the technician in charge you know i'm very um there's never always one answer to a question that we get asked sometimes um for, for you know to, to allow you to be able to make your decisions on what you're going to do and determine what's best for your site because all sites are different so just make sure that the technician that's in charge of that site is doing that work is competent to do so of course um but happy with what's going on confident that what's going on and that they understand the treatment process because um you know without that that's when things can go wrong and um you know um yeah risk mitigation kind of goes out the window so we need to make sure that, that that te um, technician on site is is in charge of it. Um, so sites where burrow baiting is used should be visited more frequently than those with secure bait boxes um, as well. And this is just the greater likelihood, as I said, of the bait coming out of the burrows um, for for non-target animals. Um, and once you, if you have a site where you know regular burrow baiting occurs, every, you know from time to time during the year, you may you know you may have a good grasp on on that site and how. 
um, and what to expect. But uh, with most pests, especially rats, we don't want to always think we know what to expect because um, it does surprise us sometimes. Just checking questions. Good well, question from David. Uh, where can I find out which rodenticides are authorised for burrow baiting and which are not? The label. Um, literally the only place, um, David, it's on the label requirement. So um, I don't, again, I don't want to hold up the label I've got here, but on this particular one, there's a, a, a separate box, um, actually oh, almost like it's separated from the label and it, it, it lists rats, mice and rats in sewers. And it tells you um, the level of uh, infestations, so what you've got. It says how many bait points you should have, application and, and advice. So um, on this one, it say, again, it says, um, direct so it's authorized cover and protected baiting points direct application into the burrows that's what it's allowed for that's its registration so product label read through it it'll tell you on there if you can burrow bait or not i can't mention specific products so hopefully no one will mention specific products because uh, i shall not respond um <laughs> so yes but in some situations daily visits may be required it really is your own assessment for that um end of treatment so revisit and make all reasonable efforts to recover and dispose of um, any unconsumed so i say i say reasonably reasonably practicable and there the word is reasonable efforts to recover and dispose of any unconsumed bait so you've got to make a reasonable effort if you get to that and you know they're um medium or relatively deep burrows that you know you just can't get to the bait you cover it over record that you've tried to recover it how much you feel is still down there and hopefully it's a, a minimal amount um, and that you've tried to recover it that, that's completely reasonable and that's the guidance um but yeah hopefully we're we're we're, we're baiting in a manner that's we're baiting just with enough not too much but we're just putting enough down um and we're doing enough revisits to say right that it's been eaten i'll put a little bit more down not just kind of you know tipping the bag up down the hole we don't want that do we so yeah making sure that your application of the rodenticide is of the required amounts rather than um over baiting and then being left with a lot of uneaten um unrecoverable rodenticide at the end um is always going to be be the best okay no other questions on that bit i'll um okay well so any other questions yeah so that comes it's a very uh, abrupt end to the presentation but hopefully the overview that you've got from that and as i said this is a design to refresh your confidence you know there's nothing in here that you've kind of seen and gone oh you know that's new or um that's exciting it's stuff you've already learned it's just because of all the changes of labels and codes of practice and well media as well you know worry about our uh, name you know your names may be getting out there in a bad way in terms of using rodenticide we want to be really certain that what we're doing is safe and you're mitigating that risk so that's what today is about is refreshing your confidence that you can do it just make sure if you do do it you need to do it and then you're recording it monitoring it being professional because that's what it's about um this whole course so yes that's that's the presentation um if we do have any more questions i can't see oh no we do have another question so from dennis so the issue is trying to convince the clients of why we have to carry out so many visits and charges as most clients do not want to pay for no more than three or four visits which is most outside baiting would need a lot more yeah dennis you're right this this issue came around I mean, it's been around for, for certainly years, but certainly when the, the crew and the stewardship and this HSE involvement saying that we need to change the way we do things came about, you know, this, this was one of the big concerns and it was brought up in many levels that, you know, educating the end user and the customer is the hardest bit and saying we, we have to do more visits, otherwise um, we're against law and then you know we're getting reports that customers are saying okay well i'll find someone else that will do it illegally in a sense and this is a real challenge but we you know we certainly be say try our best to get to those end users you know educate them on what they should expect and expectations but it also should be all of your responsibilities as well and your pride in what you do and that you're a professional to explain to them I'm a professional, I have a qualification, I do CPD, you know, all of you, 110 of you that are here, 
you're here because you want to know what you can do legally and safely because you're professionals you know those ones that aren't doing things like this are the ones out there that we should be worried about so um dennis with that it's not an easy question but educating your customer that this is a legal requirement if you voluntarily say to me you are not going to pay more money so therefore you're going to find someone else that will do it illegally then their due diligence is out the window if you know they will be just as um liable for any uh, misuse as possibly the pest control and i don't mean the product so much but the um the the ignorance of it it's 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 sad to see it does happen less i don't have as many um uh, people coming to me saying that this is a problem customers are raising their expectations but it certainly is still an issue um dennis and we're always there to help you know sort of you know any bbc member that's got a customer that's particularly um tricky in bringing around and understanding uh this change that has been around for a long time we are more than happy to talk to your customer for you um i there's nothing more i love than going to sites like that and chatting to them and kind of confusing them with you know legislation and the reasons why and sometimes it helps um sometimes it doesn't but most of the time it does uh so i do feel your pain with that but keep keep pushing it dennis it really is important because for you to say well you know my customer uh, won't pay for any more so i'll just do what they can pay for and it's putting yourself in a really tricky situation and possibly you know uh, legal stance so it's a bit um you know a bit gray to be to be um on the air and on the side of caution so yes don't do that uh, try and educate your customer and we'll try and help um anywhere we possibly can um so hopefully that's answered that i've got a few more questions so hopefully everybody would still like to keep tuned in we'll go through them how time are we on yeah we've uh sat 53 minutes we've been on so we've got another five minutes or so um so we've got luke luke vater so uh, thanks for this will you be sending out more invites for further refreshers in different aspects of pest control 100% absolutely um, we'll be doing uh, I don't want to give anything away but we will do stuff on health and safety we'll do stuff you know technical pest control and anything really that you tell us you want so if you've got any ideas if you think you know what because webinars are they're usually about an hour we you know any more than that because everybody's busy I know and you're logging in for this um, quick refresher so you know an hour is enough so if you've got any subjects that you recommend tell us please so yeah absolutely Luke we will be doing that um, from Glyn so as second generation anticoagulants have a long lasting effect on the environment is there any contact gels or foam we could use in rat burrows to prevent kicking out of bait no um uh, I'm, I'm guessing you don't mean uh rodenticide gels or foam i'm not sure if you mean rodenticide no uh, again the label will uh tell you if you can use it but i'm pretty certain you can't um and also i i wouldn't say it's necessarily you're kind of putting another product if you're talking about foams or gels like expanding foam you're just introducing another unnatural thing to uh, the soil so I would say it's unnecessary really um, just use stuff in the environment you know a, a clump of grass or soil or something that would lightly cover that burrow um, but yeah no I, I would say it's not necessary uh, so Kevin um, oh he's just saying well done okay I won't read that out because that sounds silly yeah thank you Kevin um, uh, so Nikki just interested on your views of California ban on rodenticides oh, I was reading about um, briefly read about it I didn't read about it fully um, but yes I saw that they were uh, banning rodenticide I don't know how bothered California are about it at the moment certainly I know if it was to occur over here oh, there's concerns but I think as long as we carry this crew stewardship you know of crew who who developed um these codes of practice this is here so that doesn't happen so if we follow these codes of practice and we mitigate these risks and we reduce these residues in birds we don't have to worry about losing it the hfc have said look we know you need them so let, let's let's uh, get you to put something in place that better manages rodenticide use for professional users and um, hopefully you know when the new report comes out next year on residues in birds it reduced and everyone's happy and off we go um, 
so my thoughts are, you know, uh, that's a, a problem I'm guessing they have to uh, get around um, and, you know, uh, yeah, a tricky one. So I haven't really thought about my, my views on that at the moment, but yeah, it, it could be a concerning one for that state, certainly, um, whether or not you could be in, you know, I don't know, uh, Texas and drive down over to California and probably go across the border, which would be illegal, obviously, which I'm sure may start happening. So they might be creating those problems themselves. But that's another subject for another day. Um, Elizabeth, so uh, thank you oh, for the interesting webinar again. Thank you. No problem. Uh, is it possible to get in a PDF format to circulate within my department? Is that possible? PDF? You can have the whole video. <laughs> you can have the whole video, um, Austin, if that's uh, okay. But again, give give us an email uh, and we'll sort it out all through there. Anything you need, anything you want, any other documents or questions, please, because also it keeps me uh, on my toes, you know, because so many changes and different processes and procedures and ideas on how to do things. I don't know everything about all these things. I rely on you guys telling me what problems you have or concerns you have and then we can talk about it and uh, you know get solutions to it the presentations on the crew website if they want it and the present this presentation we've just done today if you wanted to download this presentation good point uh, scott there we go my beautiful assistant as i said um you can actually download this from the crew website under uh continual professional development and resources i think training that's it uh you scroll down you'll see there's about four or five different CPD presentations that you can download and um, as I said crew have kindly allowed us to use this to do this webinar today to encourage this conversation rather than you just downloading it yourself and kind of going through it and reading it it's great to have you know somebody else um, reading it to you and inviting questions and again that's all we're talking about it uh, so yes the crew website uh, I think we so oh, we've got another, one more question uh, so do you think we as an industry do you think we as an industry be licensed to help prevent all the cowboys? Great question. Can probably speak to um, our CEO, Ian Andrews. Um, you know, he'll be interested to see what your opinion would be on that as well, um, discussion. But certainly it's um, something that is possible. Obviously, we know the Southern Ireland, um, they have PMU numbers that you have to have now to be a pest controller legally. You can't just sort of set up. You've got to uh, go through a certain process and registration and for licensing so it's coming about um, whether we we it comes about here we'll we'll see certainly for the future um, now that's the end of the questions I haven't had any more um, so with that in mind I think we're all ready to go brilliant so CPD points will be added to uh, BPCA registered accounts as well um, and also basis points will be available for basis points. It's three points for basis. So I'm just getting some updates from the back there. So you get three points for a uh, basis prompt and you have one point for BBCA registered. Um, so yes, hopefully that has been helpful to you all. Uh, if you have some contact details, get in touch and uh, yeah, we can talk about it some more. Okay. Thank you very much for listening everybody and uh, speak to you all soon. <laughs>